This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is dinosaurs and the latest news about them. I have two experts and the conversation will begin in a moment. Dinosaurs are the subject. I have two guests, Paul Serino. Is it Serino or Serino, by the way? I'm sorry. Serino. Serino on the left right. and Thomas Holtz on the right. And we'll be talking about the latest discoveries and latest tidbits about dinosaurs. So uh, before we do, I'd like to give each of my guests a few minutes to give a little background about themselves. So, Paul, let me start with you. Uh, were you, like most young boys uh, in this country, infatuated with dinosaurs from the beginning? Uh, and uh, how did you get into the field? No, actually, uh, I, I, uh, I, <laughs> I can trace my, my interest in dinosaurs to a book I stole from the high school library, which I admitted the librarian 30, 40 years later asked, asked for the book back, but then they gave it to me as a gift. <laughs> Uh, I had no interest uh, in dinosaurs in particular. I remember who, how, how, and why. You might remember those. Those are, I think, yeah. before you. I remember the how, why, and wonder books. <laughs> but I remember <laughs> those books. But I had no interest. No, it was very late. It was in college. Uh. And even not then, uh, because uh, I was interested in paleontology, uh, and I was standing in awe in the American museum halls, uh, new book out just now on, on Barnum Brown in the halls, and there I was, I was standing there just in awe at this field, and it was only later, even as a graduate student, that I came to accept dinosaurs as, as a subject of interest. Um, so it was actually quite late. Um, it was paleontology, it was art first, then science, then natural history, paleontology, then reptiles, and ultimately uh, dinosaurs. Long journey. <laughs> so very different. Would you consider yourself more of a, a the theorizer about dinosaurs, or do you like getting in the mud and the dirt and digging them up? Oh, no. I would say Tom and I both, uh, I mean, we love, and it's true, uh, there's about two-thirds of paleontologists don't get in the dirt, yeah. uh, and you don't have to. But, um, but no, it's very much uh, an attraction for me traveling the world. In fact, um, I knew it was going to, teach me more about the world than if I went to study the world in a history class. Being a paleontologist does that. Mm. Is China still sort of the hotbed of new discoveries as it was maybe 20 years ago? Uh, I don't know what you think, Tom. I think it's sort of seen its heyday, although it's going to continue to produce. I mean, as well yeah. with America. Yeah, I mean, it's such a, China is such a vast country with such a varied geology that it might be some areas we've seen most of the important discoveries from them. They'll, they'll be new ones, because the new ones are always coming out. But there are chunks of Earth history and regions of China that are only initially being explored or that need to be explored again uh, with more rigorous um, scientific approaches that will assuredly uh, bring us new discoveries from you know, throughout the history of dinosaurs, and indeed, you know, throughout Earth history, China is um, one of the greatest places to trace Earth history from the or earliest cells, you know, up till the Ice Ages. Yeah, you know, I, I would second that. I, I think North America and China have been gifted, as uh, Tom was mentioning, with just incredible uh, geologic horizons from literally from the dawn of multicellular animals, and both have them. But China, I have to give the edge to, especially. <laughs> you know, these last uh, 50 years, because um, they have this microcontinent pockmarked. We have one great mountain mm -hmm. chain that runs north to south from literally all the way to the tip of South America, but from in the North American continent, uh, where a lot of the beds are from Canada, richest dinosaur beds all the way down to Mexico. But China has this pockmarked microplate thing that with volcanoes that preserves uh, not only the early beds, equivalent to Burgess Shale invertebrates, but then preserves this combination of death by volcano and lake bed that we just don't have. In fact, no continent has it to that level. So you get this incredible biology that has revolutionized the last 20, 30 years of lake bed systems. I, I described the first bird, the first dinosaur from them. At that point, we had not the slightest idea what was coming. We had no idea. And so, Paul, uh, what university are you with? Just so for the record. I'm at the University of Chicago in Chicago. And Thomas, uh, Thomas Holtz, if you could give a little background about yourself and what university you're with. Sure. So uh, I'm Dr. Tom Holtz. I'm at the University of Maryland uh, and here in College Park, so the largest 
University in the Washington, D.C. metro area. Um, I'm in the Department of Geology, uh, but you know, paleontologists are scientists who live at the cusp. So we are people who work on the remains of ancient life that is preserved in the rocks. And as Paul was uh, alluding to before, there are plenty of paleontologists who do excellent work who are pretty much just biologists who look at dead things from ancient times. And they answer biological questions. But um, to really understand this ancient world, we need to know about the environments in which the creatures are lived, uh, the condition that they're preserved in, uh, their age, the other organisms in our environment, and that requires the geological context of it as well. Um, so you know, an individual fossil skeleton is an awesome thing, but that skeleton in the rocks it was originally found with, with the other material around it, and the pollen, and the <laughs> ash beds, and so forth, give us a much more complete picture of the ancient world. So uh, before we actually get into talk about some of the, the questions that I have regarding uh, newest dinosaur finds, one of the things that I know that most people, when they talk about dinosaurs, is they don't even really define what dinosaurs are. So I'm looking at, at uh, here on the Wikipedia page about the eight levels of taxonomy. So if we take a famous, if we take the most famous dinosaur, probably uh, Tyrannosaurus rex, uh, rex is the species, Tyrannosaurus is the genus, then above that is the family. So what would be the family of a Tyrannosaurus rex? Sure. But just just to mention here, yeah. uh, you know, we, those of us of a certain age grew up with these Linnaean ranks, yeah. like families and orders and so forth. And scientists uh, like Paul and I who work specifically in systematics and try to reconstruct the interrelationships of the diversity of life, uh, whether it's dinosaurs or trees or whatever, um, came to the recognition that these, these ranks, they're sort of metaphysics, they're not really science. Yeah. So when we say, you know, a family is the family Tyrannosauridae, and indeed it would be Tyrannosauridae that the family Tyrannosaurus is, is in, is that somehow meaningful, the, meaningfully the same as a family of ants, or a family of trees, or a family of beetles? Um, and the recognition is, it, they really aren't, and so there's been a move in the last several decades to not concentrate so much on these rank concepts, but rather concentrate on the named entities, what we call taxa, named parts of the tree of life. So, you know, within uh, the Wikipedia page, they might give you Tyrannosaurus rex in Tyrannosaurus in Tyrannosauridae, but we now recognize that Tyrannosaurus rex is in Tyrannosaurus in Tyrannosaurini, in Tyrannosaurinae, in Tyrannosauridae, in Tyrannosaur. Uh, Trasoroidea, in Tyrannoraptora, uh, in, many, um, in, in, in Solarosauria, etc., etc., up these various ranks, some of which are intermediate between the classics, say, family and order and class. Yeah, so, yeah, so that's what I'm saying. We just, we just dropped the formal tag of family. Mm -hmm. So, nothing wrong with your question. Right. Uh, Tyrannosaurus D remains valid and used by a lot of people. And it largely means the same thing, except that the group membership has trebled or maybe even quadrupled with new taxa yeah. and transitional forms that we never had before. A lot from China. Yeah. Uh, th that's a particular group that is shared uh, almost exclusively between North America and China with a lot of traffic in between. It's a very fascinating group going around and up through the Arctic to get back and forth. But yeah, that's, that's but, how we... Uh, but dinosaurs, the, t the term dinosaur is generally referred to a class, I believe? It's, yeah, but, you know, again, yeah. the class, yeah. the family, forget those titles. Okay. Uh, Dinosauria, a great name that uh, Richard Owen coined in uh, 1842, and we still use it today, only we put birds inside because right. it includes all descendants. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. you know, yeah, what sense would it be to birds were, you know, some in order? Now they're within a group that uh, used to have just uh, three or four fossil genera. So, you know, the, the rank thing, no problem if you just drop the rank yeah. and stick with Aves and Dinosauria and so on. So that's that's how we do it. So, right. And so, yeah, so Dinosauria, uh, the way that most of us would classify it or that rather would characterize it or define it today, um, and the exact, the exact species we would use to link, we might disagree on, but we'd agree on the basic description, is what makes something a dinosaur? 
was a com was it a, a descendant of the common ancestor of something like Diplodocus and something like Iguanodon and something like Allosaurus or Megalosaurus. Mm -hmm. The common ancestor of all those creatures, anything that came out of that ancestor would be a dinosaur, whether mm -hmm. it's Triceratops or, you know, little Yi, which is a tiny little dinosaur, or a hummingbird, which is also a descendant of that ancestor. So uh, that's how we would define it. How we would recognize it is a different question. What traits would we look for? And we can find traits that are in, the, in common in the ancestors of all dinosaurs, but we have to remember evolution happens, and any particular trait can get transformed. A snake is still a member of Tetrapoda, the four-legged ones, even though it's got zero legs. Yeah, um, here's, yeah here, here's one of the points made that, <clears throat> for your listeners to, uh, to grab onto. We, since Tom has entered the field, Tom's a lot younger than me. I remember when Tom came into the field. Yeah. I was already there. And there were people there before me. But since Tom has entered the field, it has grown exponentially. Yes. And journals have been metastasized into the e into the ether. And 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 the good thing about this is I'm absolutely sure Tom would agree, is that there's more dinosaurs being made now, more dinosaurs being for, uh, being being found, more research being done. There's research that I don't even know on more continents, in more countries, with more museums, and more collections than ever before. Now, can this exponential growth last until the kids that might be listening to your show become professors? I believe absolutely. But it is a century of the golden era of the fossil record that we're living in right now. That's really important for your readers, your, your listeners to, to understand. Yeah. Well, let me just ask about the... the the whole bird thing with dinosaurs, because that's within the last couple of decades or so, that's been sort of, uh, they've been brought in. Um, and I think, I think of uh, your average uh, a person scientifically just uh, skimming through, you know, articles here or there online. Um, uh, obviously, like when uh, they reclassify the planet Pluto as a dwarf planet, it seems to in some ways be a, a distinction without a difference. So when I hear uh, people saying now that uh, dinosaurs are non-avian dinosaurs, why? What is the difference between calling birds aves and calling them non-avian dinosaurs? Because when we think of dinosaurs, we think of, uh, uh, you know, I mean, birds have feathers. They, they are endothermic with ex maybe one or two exceptions. Um, so they seem to have, uh, have they not dis made themselves distinctively different from the class? <laughs> yeah. so I asked you, Dan, yeah. to name, you name two. I was asked my daughter or my son. Give me everything you think a bird is, and they will name them. You name two. How about uh, a grasping foot, a perching foot? Mm -hmm. How about, um, you know, living in, how about building nests? How about incubating? Yeah. And every single one of those that you just mentioned, we have proven, mm -hmm. arrived on the fossil scene before these creatures ever took to the air. Yeah. Okay, and so what is a bird? And so... Actually, all those traits that you talk about have earlier origins at various points in time, and that's why birds belong in dinosaurs. And that doesn't take away from modern birds. Extinction made them a very discrete group, uh, the extinction of all of their brethren. And believe me, there is a gradation where, you know, I could point uh, you at a fossil and ask you whether it's a bird or a dinosaur, and you wouldn't have the slightest say if it's arbitrary, we would have drawn a line. And, then, it is arbitrary. and in fact, the yeah. flight may not be a single point. Yeah. yeah, and so if you think about, like, uh, there's a dinosaur, Anchiornis, which eventually, uh, when enough specimens are described, may be one of the most common small dinosaurs in the fossil record. Tremendous, undescribed numbers of specimens of those are out there in some collections. Is it a bird or is it not? It's pretty darn close. It's a feathered animal. Uh, it lacks a few traits that modern birds have that Archaeopteryx also has. But it's around the same part of the family tree. You know, if it's a bird, then how about Velociraptor? Velociraptor's a feathered dinosaur. It's got a wishbone. Um, it has many of the same traits that Archaeopteryx has. If Velociraptor is a bird, then why not Tyrannosaurus? So we can go arbitrarily larger in calling things birds until it's a point of, you know, being absurd. And no one, I think, is going to advocate that Brachiosaurus is a bird. Um, but the gradation is there. Evolution happened. And 
So it's not only useful to think about something stopped, stopped being a dinosaur and started being a bird, but rather it's a dinosaur and then became a bird as well. Just yeah. as we don't say that there are mammals and bats. Yeah. We recognize that bats are a type of mammal. No one would confuse a bat with any other sort of mammal. They're extraordinarily transformed anatomy. But we still recognize they're part of this larger group, even though their, their ecology and their way of life is so radically different. Same thing for whales. We don't have whales stop being mammals, even though they're so radically different. They're so still part of yeah. mammalia. So the difference would be then uh, mammals are therapsids, although th th creatures that are just therapsids are, are extinct then. Is that correct? You can say non-mammalian therapsids. You know, yeah, okay. and, and, and that yeah, would be that, exactly yeah. the same thing. Okay, yeah. We're yeah, looking okay. at, That's you know, so what we, the, the term we use is, is, is the living group, the crown group, the, yeah. the, the, the living part of the tree, which, by the way, has lots of dead ends in it. I mean, there are fossil birds, fossil parrots, not a great fossil record, but, you know, there are fossils. But if you take the common ancestor of all living birds, from a penguin to a sparrow, they'll come back. That we call the crown clade. That's what we know as birds. And they are, in fact, the most successful. Don't let any mammal person ever tell you. There's twice as many species of birds alive today, from pole to pole. In water, they fly. They are the most successful. The dinosaurs are still with us, and they're the most successful radiation mammals. Yeah, there are half as many. Most of them are bats. So that, that, that brings up the natural question then. Uh, we've been taught then 65 million or so years ago that dinosaurs went extinct. So is that now not taught? And then the natural question is then, what was distinct about the avian dinosaurs from all the other dinosaurs, whether it's Brachiosaurus, Brontosaurus, Allosaurus, well, mm -hmm. Allosaurus wasn't around, Brontosaurus, but you know what I mean. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. So, 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 so uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, the, uh, so, yes, both things. Uh, dinosauria did not become extinct. Just all the interesting ones. That's a joke. I actually like birds. Birds are actually truly fascinating animals. But, so dinosauria didn't go extinct, but there definitely is a big selective factor there, because the part of dinosauria that survived is rather, rather different. Uh, obviously, some attributes that are different with birds is they fly, and fly fairly well. They're typically small-bodied, and so they might have a smaller uh, diet. But it's important to remember there were plenty of types of birds, or very close to birds, very close to the crown, we'll put it that way, birds that died out, too. And why yeah, so, those so, I mean, out? there was a filter. Yeah, uh, very obviously a filter at that extinction point, as Tom was mentioning, and it cleaned out anything large. The lar one of the largest things that ever made it through is an alligator like animal, which looks like uh, they do today. They, they are survivors, along with turtles, and uh, the, they're about the largest thing. Everything else that survived, mammals and birds, was, was tiny. Okay, so it cleared out lots of birds, as Tom was mentioning. It also, sadly, cleared out the pterosaurs which were big and very successful. And it cleared out, uh, you know, bats hadn't really emerged at that point. So, so but- And, and uh, also sea reptiles, mosasaurs and that. Yeah, it cleaned out, I mean, it cleaned out almost everything that uh, was large. Yep. And it was a traumatic, dramatic uh, change. And it created a new ocean uh, life that uh, literally it's uh, the Cenozoic ocean life that we would recognize today. After a while, it got going. Whales appeared, and and uh, a new balance, uh, a new a new life emerged on land as well. Uh, but uh, traces and remnants, obviously, of things that go back to the Paleozoic are still with us. But it was it was a selective extinction, and so you know you got to realize that um, you know. So you know what we're what you know, Dan. What we're both Tom and I are harking on is one of the greatest revolutions of the last of our generation. Mm -hmm and it's continuing, is that we know the tree of life in so much more detail. You know, when you go to a court of law and you present, you present some DNA evidence, and it's good, and people accept it because it's very, it's very convincing, even though they don't know the actual details and computer programs that actually link your DNA is unique, mine is unique, Tom's is unique, and if we... If we were found at the scene, there'd be no question if they got a, a, a piece of our DNA because of a building a tree which would identify us and where we fit in. Now, that's what we're doing with, with bones 
And sometimes with other features in living animals, we don't, we have the DNA, we have very little DNA beyond, you know, say, uh, you know, a million years uh, in, in the fossil record, but we use anatomical traits in the same way. And in this fa fashion, we have created this tree of dinosaur life that is magnificent and being refined all the time with new finds. So uh, let me pick up on a, a, a few questions that I had that I had done my last dinosaur show about six or seven years ago. And at that time, one of the things that made the media at least was uh, uh, Triceratops versus Taurosaurus and the idea that Triceratops was a juvenile version, even though some Triceratops was supposedly bigger. And the fellow I spoke to then told me, and I guess he was also working on it, that uh, it seems that, that they were two distinct entities. Uh, is that still what is thought of now, that Taurosaurus and Triceratops are distinct creatures? Either one of you? Well, you know, I would just say that what you're asking is probably a question which is going to arise at some point again, but um, it involves the lowest level of our discerning of species. And this is always uh, going to be somewhat tentative because our specimens are so few. And many of them, in the case of Torbosaurus in particular, the type is a very partial thing. It might be a part piece of a frill. And so you're trying to balance, looking back, in this case, 68 million years, um, individual variation. And you look at just Tom and I, and you say, okay, well, uh, we vary quite a bit in our skeleton. And now we're going to try to decide how many human species there are. Do you, know, yeah. do you know how difficult that was to understand until we got the genes that Neanderthal is really a distinct species? Well, we could still interbreed with it, but it's a distinct species. We didn't know that. And so that's what you're trying to ask, but now 68 million years ago with much less fossil material. Is Taurosaurus and Taurosaurus and Triceratops different genera? Are they different species, which would be closer? Are they subspecies? Well, convergent evolution. Well, I, Think I, I think, and I'm not up with the absolute latest that they're distinctive, but um, it, it sort of harkens to camps that we call lumbers mm -hmm. and splitters. And uh, I tend to be uh, not squarely in one or the other, but uh, I'm thinking that that there was more diversity. We're finding more diversity. Uh, it's still staggering that we have not almost positively settled the Tyrannosaurus debate, whether there's another theropod or Tyrannosaurus, but. Mm -hmm. On the herbivore side, we found quite a bit of diversity uh, at, at the end of the Cretaceous. Yeah, I would, say, I would add to that that any any time we try to identify a specimen from the past, for that matter, in the modern world, it ultimately is it's a hypothesis. So it's a question that is potentially falsifiable. One way that we could falsify that hypothesis, the idea that Taurosaurus is the final growth stage of Triceratops, is to find a sub-adult of Taurosaurus, which is distinctly different from a true classic Triceratops. So that's certainly something that is possible to, to be found. It may be in collections we have already. You have that, then you have rejected the idea that they are the same, that say Triceratops Thorsus and Taurosaurus latus, or Triceratops Taurus and Taurosaurus latus are the same animal. Um, but beyond that, what is a species remains a big question for not just paleontologists, but biologists in the modern world. It's literally called the species problem. Hmm. Um, and people will come to differing opinions, even for living forms, as to whether that how many species of giraffe are there in Africa. You know, when I was yeah. growing up and learning, everyone agreed there was one, but there are competent mammalogists who break it up into three or four. Um, it's not, these are humans trying to superimpose on a continuous branching tree of life, some tags on there. And we can disagree where we put those tags. And although we love to, people love to argue about those sorts of things, it's good to remember the big picture. And that is the tree exists independent of us and we're just trying to understand it. And names are a useful way to understand it, but it doesn't mean names are facts. Yeah. And it, it reminds me of, uh, like, uh, also the brontosaurus, the patasaurus thing, where in recent years people have said, you all, I was always thought that it was a patasaurus, brontosaurus was the, the, the classical name, but it had been a camerasaurus head put on an apatosaurus uh, skeleton, which is caused, but now in the last three or four years, apparently they have found that 
was some people have said Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus were distinct separate species. Brontosaurus has been resurrected, basically. Is, so is that still now the, 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 the consensus then? I think that's still very controversial. Uh, our own Morse information, where those dinosaurs come from, has yielded uh, vast new treasures of fossil bone, and I and and both uh, Tom and I have worked in it. And um, there's quite a bit of controversy over how many taxa. There's probably taxa that, doubtless, you have never heard of, Catadacus. <laughs> that um, you know, I just actually uh, pulled out a a, a diplodocid skeleton out of the Morse information. I don't know which one it is, you know, and, and so there's a lot of controversies and that's why there's, you know, there's plenty of, of fossil bone to work on for the next generation. But you got to understand that there's individual variation and then on top of that, you have crushing and partial non-overlap of specimens and so on. And it's, it's a fascinating puzzle for a paleontologist, a nightmare for somebody that wants a definitive answer, you know, and so... But we love it. This is what we love. We love this skill. Now, putting all that in perspective, you have to ask yourself also, how many large herbivores could be supported yeah. at the same time? How many large predators? I mean, Tyrannosaurus is just so dominant. It's unbelievable. When you go over to Africa, it's a different scene. You seem to have at least three, but if you go by some experts, there might be five or six large predators living in the same sort of general area. This is almost unheard of by mammal standards. And so <clears throat> we also have to think of the world that we're creating with these things. Um, and if they lived at the same time, all interesting questions which, for your listeners, involve the field of geology as much as biology. Mm -hmm. And so there's a couple of tracks to become a paleontologist. One of them is, um, is, is to go into the technical aspects of it, museum, curatorship, inspecting of sites, another might be biology, where you're interested in now color, uh, all sorts of biological aspects, their ther ther thermal physiology. You gotta realize that there's a whole new field of nano paleontology that's opening up where we know that some of the fossil molecules that are in those fossils are probably original, the oxygen and ice stuff that can tell us about the temperature of the dinosaur. And then there's, of course, taxonomy and, and, and geology. And, I, and, and, and these are all separate things. Where I'm working in Africa, we don't have nary a single radiometric date for any formation for animals like Spinosaurus, Carcharodontosaurus, or Jobaria, Supercroc. We're wildly guessing. So I'm bringing the geologists there because, you know, and my degree is actually in geology. I want to date those beds if we can. Yeah. Uh, an interesting thing that you that, that that comes out of this is that. From what I recall as a boy, even, and I'm sure it's, it might be just a million or two years off, stegosaurs <laughs> were more ancient to a tyrannosaur than a tyrannosaur is to us. Yes, absolutely. The, um, so it's, it's important to remember there wasn't an age of dinosaurs. There was ages and ages of dinosaurs. That Between us and tyrannosaurs, there's 66 million years. Between... A Tyrannosaurus around 66 million years ago, Stegosaurus 150 million years ago, and that's only halfway back from Tyrannosaurus to the beginning of the age of dinosaurs, to things like Herrerasaurus and Eoraptor that Paul uh, dug up in, in Argentina back in the day. Um, so Don't no, remind me how long ago that was. <laughs> <laughs> and so, well, it was easier to date on that. It was closer in time. Um, so that the... Um, the world just tremendously changed. When, when Eoraptor and Herrerasaurus were around, you could walk from Antarctica to China. It would take a long time. There would be some mountain ranges, obviously, but the continents were fused into one mass. By the time Spinosaurus was around, the world was in many ways more divided up than it is now, not just by the moving of continents, but because sea levels were so high, you know, North America was split into two or three land masses by shallow seas. Africa was divided up into chunks by shallow seas and so forth. Um, when the first dinosaurs were around, there wasn't a fruit or a flower. There were the ancestors of fruit and flowering plants, but true fruits and flowers don't seem to be around yet. If you were walking in the forests at the end of the age of Tyrannosaurus, it wouldn't be the modern world 
but you might almost be convinced you're walking in a forest somewhere in the modern world that you've never been to before. Like if you've never been to the, the forest of Northern Australia and someone told you that's what it looked like, you might go, okay, there would have been things that looked like today's magnolias and laurel trees and so forth, uh, as well as plants that would be unfamiliar to us. So the worlds that the different dinosaur dinosaurs lived in were radically different from each other and from today in many aspects. So I just recently read something about uh, uh, T-Rex jaws, and uh, they are now, from what I, this article said just a, a week or so ago, uh, it seems pretty certain that uh, T-Rex had lips and that most dinosaurs probably had lips because they can look at the little indentations in the jaw for blood vessels or something like that. Uh, is, is is that so? And if so, that brings up about 25, 30 years ago, I remember uh, the idea that some people are saying that the Platicus, if could have an elephant, could have had an elephant-like trunk, possibly, if... if yeah, so, you know, I would say we, we, we have, have justified the former and have discarded the latter. Yes. Generally because, uh, you know, trunks, uh, which was uh, an idea that, um, you know, was forwarded as, as, uh, as a possibility, generally have a smooth base uh, they're, they're muscular, they, they leave sort of rounded edges on, on, on a larger narial opening than what we see in sauropod dinosaurs. And, and also, there's two things. Um, we mammals have a lot of facial musculature, I'm using it for all my facial expressions. Reptiles don't have that. They have a tiny little muscle in the nose and that's about it. And we think dinosaurs and, and birds, uh, their descendants, are clearly the same. And so there's no muscles that are readily available to make a trunk. But that was not the case in mammals, and they developed trunks, you know, multiple times. So that idea discarded. But the idea, the other idea, uh, that they had lips is a good one. And you, you might know from, you're familiar, and your, your listeners are familiar with the human skull. It's smooth. We have just a few openings when you look at uh, a human skull. And that's because our skin is loose. And so blood vessels and nerves can travel in the flesh out of a single opening, no problem, and get everywhere on your face. Not so on a dinosaur or a bird where you have a lot of scales or, or a crocodile really tightly adhere to the bone. Then they have to go inside the bone. They leave canals. And, and when you don't have that, i.e. when you have lips, it reverts to the condition that we see in mammals, and it's smooth. And that's what we see, and that's why a lot of people are convinced that a lot of the toothiness that you see in the smiling dinosaurs should actually be covered at least partially, or maybe even completely, by lips. Because we see the smooth margin you were talking about at the base of the teeth, right at the margin of the jaw. And that suggests that there was loose flesh there, and it wasn't armored. Yeah. Now, crocodiles themselves don't have lips, and we're a little bit, they barely have tongues. Because they hang out in water, they don't need it. They're not land animals uh, uh, entirely. And so we tend, I think, to, to pay more attention to them than maybe some of the lizards that are lipped. You know. Anyway, that's, that's what I think that stands. That's, that's my thoughts on that. Maybe Tom has some uh, different ideas. No, I, I would definitely go with that. And I would just point out to uh, the people watching the podcast or the video, uh, is that if you want to... If you look at, it, let's say, here a, a cast of a, a Tyrannosaurus skull, obviously greatly reduced in size, or you see the cast behind Paul, and you see all this toothiness, and you just feel, oh, that they must have been impressively toothy in life. Look at the skull, if you can, do a web search, of a Komodo dragon. Yeah. There are these nasty, sharp, pointy teeth in there. Um, then look at a photograph, or if you're lucky enough to have a zoo near you with them, go and see a Komodo dragon. And you don't see the teeth from the outside unless they're opening up and munching on something. And even then, you don't see the teeth sticking out so much because they're, they're sort of deep in the gums. And yet, if they were to bite into you, you would, you would be feeling it. So um, it doesn't take anything away, for those who might be concerned, it doesn't take anything away from a Tyrannosaurus or an Allosaurus to have them have a libby face. They would still be fearsome predators. They just wouldn't be having these fangs out all the time like a fantasy dragon. Now you wait, and there's, there'll be nanopaleontology researchers that will push this horizon further to answer that question technically. For example, uh, Tom, if you look carefully, he smiles with his teeth. I don't. My teeth are essentially covered by lips. 
I, I don't smile with my teeth. Now, when Tom stops smiling, his lips close. His teeth would be different if they were exposed to air, like you see some of the reconstruction uh, of, of the dinosaurs 100% of the time. Yeah. The enamel is actually different. The enamel is made to be covered by a lip and to be wet and moist. And it really, there's a molecular structure, a signal that this is the kind of, so Dan, this is the kind of thing, this is the biggest gift of paleontology to science. It causes you to ask questions that you wouldn't otherwise ask mm -hmm. if all you had were the living animals around. But here we are asking questions about lips and enamel because we're interested in Tyrannosaurus rex and it causes us to relook at modern animals and figure out all sorts of new things about them. So uh, let's talk about some of the things. If, if dinosaurs could not have expressive faces the way a primate or even a cat or oh, a dog. Oh, I didn't say that. I didn't okay. say that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but well, not but, with but, muscles. <laughs> okay. But, but that wouldn't be their primary necessarily way of communicating. I would think that it would probably be something like smells. It might be something like sounds, like some of the, the ornate displays I've heard you know, on the backs of heads. They would make interesting sounds. And also, uh, I've never heard uh, or, or seen, has there been research into uh, venomous dinosaurs? Did dinosaurs have venoms? Did they have perhaps sacs that if we, we know all about the clubs, uh, the thagomize of Stegosaurus and the clubs of Ankylosaurus, but was there a dinosaur that was the equivalent of a skunk that if uh, Allosaurus came along, he'd shoot, you know, uh, three t uh, three uh, gallons worth of crap into his face, you know? Well, let, let, let me just insert one thing before Tom, before Tom can answer that question, and that's to say that we are very biased by humans. Uh -huh. So the symphony of muscles that you see on the face of a human, which uh, can go away with a, one blow to your ear uh, region uh, and affecting the nerves, is peculiar to humans and probably Neanderthals and Denisovans. When you go to a chimp, they have a far cry, very few. Now, the most amazing thing that we've learned is that the dog that you like that can raise one eyebrow, that actually evolved after dogs and humans got together in imitation of humans. Wolves don't have the capability to move an eyebrow. So, so humans dog. selectively bred that because they like it looked human like that. It, it's, it's, it's like it's communicating almost like it's the most incredible thing that we've been able to determine by the genetics of dogs. So, yeah, okay. We have facial expressions, but mammals in general don't. And your dog being, uh, some dogs being a bit of an exception. But so dinosaurs have, have in fact, more better communication when we look at birds. They have more sophisticated sound box that we have. Our larynx, we're constantly choking. It's in a stupid position, way up in our, our throat. I mean, a bird and probably presumably a dinosaur, they have a syrinx much more adept at, at sound range and, and, and can make all sorts of sounds, including every sound a human can make, you know, from the lyrebirds, down in their lungs where it should be. Okay, so, that, so there's nothing to sneer at with a dinosaur. We don't have to make them look like humans. Um, they were communicators without a doubt in a lot of different ways. Yeah, and if you consider, you know, birds, we all, every, everyone knows that birds are very talky organisms. They communicate uh, with other species. They communicate, you know, adult to adult, courtship communication to the babies, babies, even late stage embryos making peeping sounds uh, when the eggs are about to hatch. All those statements are also true of the next closest living relative to dinosaurs, which are the crocodilians. They're very talky animals. People haven't appreciated it as much. Their, their, their repertoire might not be as fancy as a mockingbird or even a chicken, but they'll talk. They warn other organisms with sound. They'll talk to male to male. And there'll be courtship sounds. There are sounds of adults to babies and babies to adults, and even late-stage embryos make little sheeping sounds when they're about to hatch. So, Dan, it's, it's even... It's even more profound than that. So if we look at birds, living dinosaurs, there's several kinds of birds that have vocal learning. Vocal learning is something that only humans have among mammals, where you can hear a sound, maybe your name, and then you internalize it, and out it comes out of your mouth. This is an incredible thing. We call it vocal learning, where I heard your name, Dan, and then I just said it. Uh, it went in here. And it came out there. Birds, several groups of birds have this, okay? Cockatoos being the most famous. They can sing songs. They, can, they, 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 they know the beat. 
This takes that talent back 30 million years in dinosaurs, living dinosaurs, easily. We humans evolved it a million years ago, and we transformed it into language, something they didn't do. It's one of the greatest mysteries. Why didn't the dinosaurs, why didn't the dinosaurs, they had vocal learning, they've had it globally for 20, 30 million years. Well, you know what? They, uh, they, they're doing pretty well. Well, let me just ask you, because I know... But anyway, it's, I, it's amazing their communicative skills. I know corvids, for example, can if you screw over a, a raven, it'll <laughs> tell the other raven, and, you, and they can they can know if you're wearing a mask or not, because I, I once down cut, a, cut down a limb from a tree, and I guess it must have been a corvid living there, and the next, the next uh, spring, I was out mowing my lawn, and I, boom, I got thumped in the head three times, probably from a raven was like, you motherfucker, you destroyed my house. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I, uh, I, I poke fun at the Paleontology Policy Center Department because I say, you know, if you look, the human tree, like the dinosaur tree, has gotten a lot more complicated. Not only do you know Denisovans and there's going to be another one, but you, you go back and there's new species being named all the time. It, it's a very crowded tree. But guess what? There's only one species alive today. And where did all the others go? It's like we are the last of the of the line, there used to be three and four species like us available. And I asked the panel, but you know, listen, I mean, come on, we had tools. We had tools for three million years. All these species had tools, had communication abilities. What is going on? Uh, we are so weak that we have gone extinct. Well, you know, maybe one of us can be competed with the other one. That that can only go so far. Now we just new paper out. You know, Cro Magnons were living with the Neanderthals for thousands of years. You know, so now. And we are, we tend to want to believe, truly. We want to see everything in our image and we want to believe we're superior. But when we get down to it, we have gone through an extinction cycle that has almost nicked us out. In fact, our genes are so similar, we know we all descended from a common ancestor 200,000 years ago on Africa. We're very similar genetically, you, me, and everyone else. Well, didn't we um, also go through a bottleneck in Malaya, in the Malaya Peninsula or something? Well, we went to a bottleneck in Africa, and then after that, uh, there were many emissaries of humans out of Africa, human-like animals, hominids, that just bit the dust, you know, uh, all, all the time. You know, Neanderthals being uh, the most uh, commonly known, but there are many, many others. And finally, 200,000 years ago, a line came out, and success, we were able to colonize every continent, and now we're destroying the world. Why? Because, not because we're smart, because we have this other technique, this other trait, which is a an awkward trait. We eat everything. Uh, crows, you know, pigs, bears, there's very few animals that eat everything because you don't eat anything well. We can't eat plant matter well. Most of it, it generates nothing. We don't eat meat well. We don't eat anything well, but the problem is we eat everything. And that income, our tool making abilities, and then this funny thing that developed called language has allowed us to overpopulate the world and we are destroying it at, at the moment. But we hopefully we're smart enough to save ourselves. I'm not sure about that. But we're the last of the species. So if you think about that, now remember earlier I told you, name me anything about a bird that you can think of. There are a few things, but I don't think you can think of them <laughs> that was not present in pre-birds. Okay, that roots that tree in dinosaurs. Now I'm going to tell you, name me something other than language about yourself, about a human that was not in fact. Invented first among the dinosaurs. Opposing thumb? No, yeah. we have that. In fact, we got opposing toes on feet. Uh, vocal learning? No. Tool making? No. There's not a single thing that a human does, except language, that was not in, that is unique to humans. So just we got to put ourselves in place. We're lucky to so, be here. Uh, but I want to get back to asking Tom about the, the, the poison, uh, the venom and that stuff. Oh, but I, I, I just want to pick up, since you brought it up, uh, Paul, uh, that brings to mind the, the famous, uh, infamous uh, dinosauroid man of 1970s. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that we're evolving towards, if you know, like UFO abduction law, it looks sort of like the dinosaur and some people think there's some kind of connection. So I, do we know, for example, number one, could they have evolved intelligence? And number two, were dinosaurs as whatever you want to call it, a class, a non-avian dinosaurs? Uh, I've also heard that people are saying that did, that the amount of species were, were getting lower and lower before the asteroid anyway. So 
if you could clear those two things up, uh, Paul. Yeah, uh, Paul, uh, Tom, uh, go ahead. Yeah, with that last point, that you can find statisticians, paleostatisticians, who, depending upon what aspects of the record they emphasize, can say either that the diversity was clearly declining, possibly declining, or remaining stable, and the appearance of declining has to do with uh, unequal sampling. What we can definitively know is that dinosaurs overall were still doing fairly well where we recover them in the later part of the Cretaceous. Um, that you would find representatives of major groups, not every group, but major groups, all the way up to the point of the extinction. So um, there wasn't a turnover, but there's always turnover going on. There's turnover throughout mammalian history since the end of the of the Mesozoic. That doesn't mean mammals are going extinct. Um, so um, let's see. So that, that that's the, the issue of uh, of the diversity question you were asking about. Yeah, and then uh, well, wouldn't that also depend too? If if we looked at at the amount of human remains, let's say in 10 million years, if we looked on what was now Christmas Island versus downtown Shanghai, yes. we'd get something very different. Absolutely. And where we, we do not have, we would love to have a continuous fossil record at every corner of the world at every time slice. But nature doesn't do that. You, know, you only get fossils forming where you've got a sediment source. So something's being uplifted and torn apart by weather and so forth somewhere and a place to pile it up. And when you don't have those two conditions, you're not going to form fossils, but that's it, not even enough, because we have to be able to access those fossils. So the spot the fossils accumulated have to subsequently be exposed on the surface and found by paleontologists, or more often people who are just looking around find fossils and letting paleontologists know. So not every spot on the Earth has a good record. Out here in the eastern part of North America, you know, as I'm sitting here, we don't have a good record for dinosaurs for the vast majority of dinosaur history, and what little record we have pales in comparison to what we could find out in the American West. Hmm. But even out in the American West, we don't have very good, say, middle Jurassic dinosaurs, whereas if we went to some parts of China or we went to Great Britain, we could find middle Jurassic dinosaurs or, or, or northern Africa. Um, and so... The fossil yeah, record is, is, as Tom was saying, is, yeah. is really a, a patchwork uh, of little mm -hmm. snippets here and there. The beautiful thing about it uh, is that it keeps giving. Yeah. And uh, it's just, it's unbelievable. Uh, if you asked me back when I was a graduate student and we had more dinosaurs in New York than anywhere else on, uh, in North America, that we would have many collections by the time I was... Uh, an aging professor uh, out west that dwarf the collections uh, you know, on the east coast. I'd say not, no way. That's there'd be museums that I never heard of popping up here and there. But and and that's because uh, more people know about dinosaurs. I mean, in my lifetime, I, I tend to gravitate towards the continent least explored, the continent with the harshest you know landscapes that have um, kept paleontologists at arm's length. <laughs> for various reasons, the Sahara. And because there, I, anything I pick up is going to be something new, or maybe something I knew before, but something new. And it's very exciting. But um, even in North America, it is just, everybody knows. In my lifetime, the Tuareg nomads in the middle of the Sahara came to understand what a dinosaur is. And uh, when I first went there, they weren't sure if they were alive somewhere, which is what you know we thought about fossils when we first picked them up. And the world is getting smaller, but what the, the reason I'm saying it's beautiful is that for your listeners, uh, there's more opportunities. You know, it's one of the rare fields where there's truly more opportunity. And we're getting older as a society, so there's definitely opportunities in healthcare. <laughs> you know, but there's opportunities in paleontology. So and we, I'm going to be finding uh, amazing things. So let me just, uh, I want to take a break here and then we'll do a final segment or so. Uh, uh, do we know if there were any scent sacs? Did dinosaurs spray like uh, a, a lot of uh, current animals? And again, are they like was it monitors or commoders that have the poisonous, or do both of the both? Do we know if dinosaurs had poisons and and scented? 
Right. As far as spraying, there's definitely no evidence of that yet. And even finding out evidence of that is going to have to require some sort of uh, chemical preservation of soft tissue organs, which are possible. It's possible. We don't have any evidence for that yet. Additionally, there aren't too many members of the reptile group of Sauropsida, so lizards, snakes, turtles, crocs, birds, and their extinct relatives, that do send out musky signals. There are some, but not too many. So maybe there were some dinosaurs that did it. We don't have any evidence of it. As for poison, there have been some arguments of the teeth of a particular raptor dinosaur, a dromaeosaur, which was interpreted as being poison grooves uh, that some venomous animals have on their, in their fangs. But most people who have looked at that independently do not agree that those are venom grooves, and rather they're just part of the normal development of the ever-reproducing sets of teeth that a, a dinosaur, and indeed most reptiles, would generate throughout their life. So no definitive evidence of that. In contrast, there are some fossil animals, but not dinosaurs, that do show what might be, honest to goodness, venom grooves in their teeth. And so those might be candidates for things that had a, a poisonous bite, or a venomous bite. Okay. Yeah, so, and, and you have to consider, what animals use that, <clears throat> that method? Well, they tend to be rather small, uh, ectothermic animals that uh, have bruises in the teeth, or in, in, in the case of some snakes, can actually use venom. Uh, to subdue their prey. That's not really your your average dinosaur. It's an upright predator that's going to chase something down or uh, dispatch of it with uh, powerful jaws and claws. Uh, very different model. I'd be very surprised if there was you know something like that uh, you know widespread among among carnivorous dinosaurs. So as, as far as the spitting again, so. We we know that Hollywood uh, tends to mix fiction and and reality. And they did absorb a few things. But the other thing about Hollywood is that when they make a mistake, they stick with that mistake. <laughs> so, uh, they just stick with that mistake no matter what. And so if, if they invent something and it's actually, as the case of spinning, we, we have no, not much evidence to apply to that. But if they invent a velociraptor, it's twice the size of a velociraptor, it's got the wrong skull shape and uh, doesn't have any feathers and so on, it might add a tiny few feathers. But they don't go with the evidence and actually revise it because they have a sequel to make, yeah. and then a sequel to the sequel. And there's lots of millions of dollars on the line, and someone would say, "Wait a second, is this a new dinosaur?" No, we're just in. so yeah. You can't trust Hollywood uh, for fact versus fiction. Yeah. Um, and you know, bless their hearts, if they would, if they would improve, this is, that's the difference between science and Hollywood. When we realize the mistake, we fix it. They don't. <laughs> so. Uh, one of the things, uh, there have been lots of popular books about reconstructions of dinosaurs, and we've slowly, I know we're getting to know what the coloration of the skin is like, that they had feathers, etc. But for example, you could take an obese uh, human being, and there might not be many telltale markers left on the bones that this person was obese. Do we know, for example, uh, just how much flesh, how much, or if there was fat uh, that some dinosaurs had. Did an old T. Rex get fat? Uh, and and how could you tell uh, something like that? Either one of you. Well, that that would be very difficult because the ability for us to add and lose the soft tissues, you know, that can go rather rapidly, much faster than the rate of bone growth. Um, and if we look at a lot of species of animals today. Over the course of the year, between the lean year, the lean part of the year, and the, the fatty part of the year, they'll bulk up. Um, you know, whether it's along the tail, like in some crocodilians and so forth, the lizards, um, or elsewhere on the body, um, whether the going is good, you know, get some get some stuff on your body because there'll be a season if it's if they've got a lot of seasonality when food is less plentiful and you can eat off your reserves. Um, so. Any individual is likely to change on the shorter term bases faster than the skeleton itself uh, would change. There'd be slight modifications throughout the year, but not as much as the soft tissue on top of it. Have we yeah, found that? You know, so today, huge influx of data because of CAT scanning. And so 
we're CAT scanning not just fossils, but we're CAT scanning recent organisms. And you get to know the volume of flesh, for example, in a Komodo dragon and any of the large lizards. So we just did a reconstruction of Spinosaurus and had to really revise what we were thinking to add, in fact, as Tom was mentioning, more weight around the hips and tail than we had anticipated uh, considerably more, uh, given the largest lizards and crocodiles all showing, and, and birds, mm. all showing this pattern of flesh that we would not necessarily put there, just looking at a skeleton and making a wild guess. And so there's a lot of information now on, on extant animals, the amount of flesh on the neck, on the hands, to give us some idea, a better idea, of how to reconstruct these dinosaurs. Are we finding more dinosaur mummies? Do we know where to look for mummified dinosaurs more likely in this valley than that valley? Do we have do we have sort of guide maps to find these things that? Well, we're... I, I, I'm working on these mummies, and they come from uh, an area famous. And I, I actually one of the deep mysteries I'd love to solve is why there's so many mummies in Central East uh, Wyoming. They've been found, uh, you know, in various places and lake beds and so on, but in North America. What we call a mummy, it's not actual skin. We're actually trying to do some of the narrow painting intelligence on it, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an impression. Uh, but, Tom, unbelievable. We've got toenails. Ooh, got awesome. Kind of dinosaur. Excellent. Uh, it's one of the mummies. And uh, we, we've seen lots of toenail footprints. You know, we know what they look like. But to actually have the replaced toenail on a mummy, and so, and the whole, the, the beautiful skin on the back that show. You know, in the American Museum, when I was uh, there as a student, you know, he's a beautiful and monosaurus mummy, but there were parts that we didn't know. We didn't know the frill on the back, and now we've got that frill in unbelievable detail. So, what you know, how these things form exactly is still to be described in detail. Uh, we know the general principles, and uh, you know, it involves drawing. But why there's so many of these, I, I think it's got to be a side. I'd like to see an isopack map to see the thickness of the land formation, because I'm thinking right in the, it's got to be in the belly of that formation where there was a lot of flooding and drying and flooding and drying that shoveled these dried carcasses and suddenly buried them. We have a tyrannosaur and we have several of the monosaurs from that, uh, from that part. Awesome. When we think of uh, fossils, whether it's dinosaurs or not, most people think of big things. We think of woolly mammoths, we think of uh, uh, saber-toothed cats, cave bears, we think of uh, the, the sauropods, we think of the T-Rex. Even going back to the car Carboniferous, you think of three-foot-long dragonflies. Um, is, there, is there any common thread to periods on Earth where we had megafauna and then you know, there's extinction and there's a lot of small animals, and then we get to megafauna. Is, is is that related to oxygen levels or anything else that we know of? Well, we, we can, can talk, talk about the current time slice, the Holocene, uh, which, to be fair, includes the very largest animal we know of in Earth history in terms of mass, and that's the blue whale, which still exceeds any... any dinosaurs. There were dinosaurs that were longer, but they weren't as massive. Mm -hmm. But if we look at land animals today and we compare it to... 20,000 years ago, sure, there's a lot less megafauna, 40,000 years ago, even more. That's an easier one to explain. We're just through a, a megafaunal extinction, um, to which climate probably had some um, aspects of it, but climate changes had been going on, radical climate changes for two and a half million years before that. So there's a human component almost assuredly to that as well. Um, so we don't when we look at the distribution of big animals today, we're not seeing a quote-unquote natural system. We are seeing a system after humanity has been throwing stuff down the black hole, and as, as uh, Tim Flannery says, it's the black hole between our nose and our chin, um, that uh, we have eat, helped eat the world, or maybe not directly eating it, but caused enough environmental change uh, that much of the normal community would be like. Yeah, and, you know, it, it's also easy to say that, and, and some people believe that oxygen has to do with uh, body size at some level, but that for this huge, huge time period when dinosaurs were dominant on land, there was an animal called a sauropod, and there's never been any herbivore that has approached the body size and capacities of this herbivore. Uh, 
it was fermenting, we believe, because we, we failed to find any gastrolus. It had mouth parts that would, you know, be embarrassing to a cow. And yet they grew to these enormous sizes that uh, herbivores can only dream of today. So this is a combination of physiology and evolution, irrespective of oxygen levels, because you have these kinds of animals for 100 million years, 100 million years occupying every continent. And uh, they're just amazing herbivores. So evolution has something to do with it, too. Uh, oxygen levels have something to do with it. And we may see giant animals like that again if, uh, if we don't destroy the planet. <laughs> so uh, I, we, we know about the Chichilub crater and uh, the end of the dinosaurs, uh, non-avian dinosaurs. Uh, I want to talk about two things also outside of Earth uh, and, and just throw them by you. I once interviewed, actually twice interviewed a fellow who studies uh, the wobble of the galaxy and, and, and the, the, the solar systems ride through the ecliptic of the galaxy. And he claims that it happens every few centuries or whatnot. And he wrote a couple of books detailing supposedly the rise and fall of uh, of uh, uh, sperm uh, counts in, in human males. And so I was just wondering, has there ever been any sort of uh, astronomers uh, meeting with paleontologists discussing, trying to find out if if they're over the, the course of the age of Earth, uh, any patterns between the way that the solar system, the Earth moves around, or, 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 or things that, that, that affected the Earth and ancient life by things outside of the Earth. Yeah. Is there any kind of, well, I guess you would call it the, what is the modern term? Uh, uh, well, any, in any well, combination. Yeah. Yeah. Terrestrial influences, yeah. yeah. Right. Sure, there's, there's been attempts, and every, every scientific generation, you get someone coming out with this paper thinking that they discovered it for the first time. There have been attempts to find and claims of the discovery of a periodicity to mass extinctions in Earth history, and then it attempts to, to tie that into something in the extraterrestrial, extrasolar extra system environment, including passing through the, the plane of the ecliptic, uh, the, the, the galactic uh, plane, on and off. The problems with that is, has, some of it has to do with the dating, uh, the, the dates have shifted back and forth over the years as we've become much more precise in terms of radiometric dates and what we're calling a mass extinction or not. I mean, there are, we talk about the big five and then, of course, the current one going on, which people refer to the sixth extinction. But there are arguments whether the one at the end of the, of the Paleozoic, is that one extinction or was there actually another really massive extinction between the Middle Permian and the Late Permian? And there are debates that go on about this. So um, if both your variables, the time and the intensity of extinction, have big error bars, um, then it becomes rather less secure if you've got this periodicity that you're testing. It's not, a, it's not a reasonable hypothesis, and it's worth being revisited again and again. That said, other than the end of the Cretaceous, the famous, famous of the mass extinctions, there seem to be strong terrestrial signals of some environmental tra cha change from below rather than from above that's tied into it, whether it's this massive volcanism at the end of the Triassic as Pangaea gets rifted apart, the even more massive volcanism at the end of the Paleozoic, um, those seem to be sufficient to explain the disasters we see then and don't seem to necessarily have had a, a trigger from outside Earth's atmosphere. If I, if, if I might link back to your bringing up of the dinosauroid, um, the deep question here is, is there anything rational about a dinosaur, or for that matter, a human? Would we arrive again if evolution, uh, if evolution's tape of life will run again? And this is, uh, you know, a Gould question built on top of a Fermi question, which is why, why we haven't heard from anybody else out there in the universe. Fermi paradox. And, and my colleagues, uh, we have one of the greatest uh, exoplanet uh, groups here on campus, and and the the new satellite they just launched is going to revolutionize that, just like. Our fossil record has been revolutionized. We have seen planets 
now. And we know how many planets are out there. We know how many Earth-like planets are out there because we had an Earth that started without an ocean and get an ocean and then we'll eventually lose our ocean. And would, is there something, you know, because the dinosauroid, in essence, is the belief that dinosaurs would evolve into something that would look like us. That's, in essence, the hypothesis. But the answer is, we know what they evolved into. They evolved into birds. And they don't look a lot like us. They have some similar features, but they don't look a lot like us. And we're not going to look a lot like them. And so the answer is, is life going somewhere? Is it headed towards intelligence and a human condition? I have a strong opinion about that. But I don't believe so. I think we're a fluke. And I think that we have this wonderful opportunity to enjoy dinosaurs and the fossil record because only one species, as much as you want to grant dinosaurs intelligence, ability to communicate and so on, only one species truly understands time. And that's our, that's uh, what Tom and I uh, play with. That's our, that's our playground, time. Yeah. And, and we, we understand it and that's our business as, as paleontologists. Well, you, you, you anticipated what I was going to finally ask because I wanted to get a little bit more speculative. And, you know, I, I've done actually shows about the rare earth versus the mediocrity principle. Right. And, uh, uh, you know, my, my, my own self, and I want to talk a little bit about exobiology since I didn't know you had, uh, you, you mentioned that, Paul. But uh, I know that, uh, you know, I my own personal belief from everything I've ever read is that life might be plentiful, but it it's probably, you know, life we might not even recognize most of the life in the cosmos as we define life, you know, Hoyle's black cloud and that kind of thing. Um, but, uh, you know, you mentioned the Fermi paradox. There's also this idea of the great filter. And I, I think these are things that are interesting, but until you have more than one planet right. with life, you, it, it's, it's ultimately kind of silly. But uh, since you mentioned it, Paul, and then uh, you, you can comment too, Thomas, uh, uh, do you ever sort of, uh, if we can now tell what the atmosphere of a planet, and it's you know one point two times the gravity of Earth or the si the mass of Earth, and uh, you know there used to be the idea that Venus was a sweltering pot, uh, pot of uh, dinosaurs and stuff back. Um, what what do we know about dinosaurs in general and even all ancient life that we could can we use some basic principles in exobiology? Do you think going forward, uh, either one of you? Well, our knowledge of dinosaurs show us the possibilities that have been manifested in at least one world. That looking at the diversity of life today gives us a sense of what's possible in the, for evolution. But opening up the fossil worlds of the vanished past, that shows us even more ways of being things. Um, if there is animal grade life out there, which I suspect there's a strong suspect there is animal grade life elsewhere in the cosmos, that doesn't mean that there are people in the sense of a uh, of intelligent technological things, or that we might be vanishingly rare. Um, but if there are animal grade life, they are going to be as different from us in many ways as anything in the fossil record is from us today. That we have. Earth has not exhausted its possibilities of the ways of being an animal or a plant or even a protist. Um, well, a fungus. And we're just one, yeah, we're just one case. Um, so, you know, I would love to be able to know what life looks like out of the world. So ever since I've been a little kid, I've been a science fiction fan. Um, I doubt I'll ever know about the, what life looks like out of another world. I might live to see evidence in atmospheres of other worlds. So interferometry mm -hmm. might be able to get us the atmospheres of other planets that might give us biomarkers. Um, but we wouldn't know what the actual physical organisms look like. Um, it's so be cool to know that, that life is out there. Um, but, you know, I, I like the world of macroscopic things. I like to be able to see the organism. I doubt I'll ever be able to do that. Um, but the fossil record shows us at least one set of possible ways of being things. Um, and it, it is different and wonderful than the even wonderful stuff we have today. It, it's, a, it's a weighty part of the story. Looking with the new telescopes is the other half. But in fact, to understand the last uh, 
billion years of life uh, plus on on Earth uh, tells you an enormous amount about the question that you ask. And it's very clear that life originated very soon after the Earth cooled to a point where where water uh, permanent water was present, and so that life seems to come relatively easy. But what what happens after that is anybody's guess. You got to realize. We're very focused on us all the time. So vertebrates are just one of this huge spectrum of non-vertebrate phyla. And if you look at the intelligence of non-vertebrate phyla, you see there are some rather intelligent forms um, that lived in the ocean. Uh, I love scuba diving to meet them every once in a while. An octopus uh, comes to mind that have... Uh, are, but that's the apogee of, of intelligence in the oceans, more or less. And what do they do? Uh, well, they uh, hide under rocks. Sometimes they eat each other. And um, they're, they're wonderful, beautiful animals. My octopus teacher, you know. Yet, uh, are they communicating to other worlds and creating civilization and so on? No. But they're happy and they have, are extremely well adapted, unbelievable creatures with what well, they can do. Cuttlefish, because they can get yeah, on unbelievable. But they are not like us any more than, you know, this the, the fictional dinosaur, right? I mean, this is, so they, they, you know, this is what life could be. Yeah. And, and, and so, um, you know, we humans are a very late creature on the scene. Most of our kind went extinct, we survived just long enough to cause real problems for the planet. And that's the proper way to look at the fossil record from a human point of view. And what there is out there could be, like you say, unrecognizable. But I don't think it's going to look like a human. I don't think there's any chance it will look like a human. <laughs> yeah, it, it reminds me of, uh, I don't know if you know uh, Lauren Isley. Lauren Isley wrote uh, on, on A Thousand Worlds, about the man is ultimately alone because even if there is, I forget how he, he phrases it so wonderfully, even even if there is intelligence out there, we will probably still be lonely. Yeah, you know, and, and, and because there's so many worlds, as Carl Sagan would say, billions and billions, you know, any probabilistic statement you make, like, well, is there no ch little chance that a human, well, some can say, well, there's a billion chances, so there could be a chance. But let me, let me end by saying this, that my mother was an identical twin. She differed from my aunt, who I saw for the first time when I was 15. I could recognize the two. But from the moment that that cell separated, they were already different. Mm -hmm. Then they had different wound positions in the wound, and then they had different weights at birth. And then, even though they were dressed the same, they, and you've probably seen the show about three identical strangers. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. The, these, there's no identity. And why? Because... The cytoplasm is different, and there's a billion genes, and they're methylated different. There are no identity, and that sets you on a course to be unique. It's, a, it's just absolutely incredible that you look at Tom, me, and you. We are three. No one would mistake us, okay? And yet, and, and, and or anyone else. There's nobody exactly like you, which is an incredible statement when there's billions of people. There's nobody exactly like you. I need three facts about your life, and, and I can tell you apart from anybody else. And that's why there's no humans elsewhere in the universe, because there's no chance that evolution would create this weird, upright, walking thing without whiskers that goes through the environment that came from a swinging nut. No, not a chance in the world. I, f I forget what sci-fi author said famously at the beginning of a book that life is the rust on small, rocky worlds. So maybe to a, a grander <laughs> being than us, we're just micros. But th uh, uh, Thomas, if you want to ha have a final say? Um. Sure. Um, tying it back to the dinosauroid, and that way it, it keeps the dinosaur theme in there. Um, it's it's true that that in this case, Dale Russell, the uh, scientist, um, the paleontologist who was largely responsible for coming up with that, um, he, he wanted to create something there that he thought was plausible, and we know that humans that we can happen at least once. But I think there was a little too much of what, what Paul was talking about before, and that's seeing us in all of nature. Mm -hmm. We are just one manifestation of nature. Nature can be so many different things, and I think that's the more wonderful aspect. I think I would I would be much more interested if we had the possibility of meeting an alien intelligence 
of seeing how weird and different it is, even to its approach to intelligence, than meeting green-skinned people that look like us. Uh, in fact, I'd be kind of sad if that's what the universe is made up of. You know, or the, the little the little gray bald guys who go around in disc-shaped ships and have an obsession with human proctology. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, I don't want those things to be real. I, I second that. I mean, I think we can learn a lot from dinosaurs as an independent, upright, uh, bipedal. They were the first bipeds. We were not. Uh, they, they went bipedal in a more sensible way. They developed a sound mechanism in a more sensible way. Uh, their, their courtship behaviors now, they actually uh, got rid of penises. This is a horrible thing. We're still living with this, uh, <laughs> with this organ that causes and body size differences. It causes all sorts of problems in our society. Uh, you know, the birds, the singing birds, they got rid of it. They said, why do you need this? We don't need it. Um, we don't need it to speciate. We don't need it to mate. And it just causes problems, you know, physical abuse. And they got rid of it. And it, it, you can learn from dinosaurs and their kin amazing things that reflect back on our own human existence and biology. And that's, I think, the biggest thing that uh, I've, I've learned from dinosaurs. And I want to get to know them a little more personally, so I'm going to be housing some Himalayan pheasants to uh, understand their, uh, <laughs> yeah, their personalities. It, it, <laughs> from what you were you're both saying, it seems like we suffer from sort of anthropic pareidolia when we deal with other oh, kinds. Of absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's one of the human, there's no question that it's one of the human traits. You know, there's a lot of things that are uh, unique psychologically to humans, but one of them is that we, 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 we desperately want to see in evolution or in our existence uh, some rationale, some way of explaining why we're here, and uh, to accept that it's, it's, um, it's chance piled upon chance. Is, is simply not one of the things that we're, we're willing to very easily accept. Yeah. And so um, dinosaurs must be evolving toward us. Now, uh, Dale Russell passed away recently. He was a great uh, paleontologist that pushed forward the idea of the bird likeness of, of these raptors among uh, just a few researchers of his generation. And I was at the American Museum as a graduate student when he walked into my office one day and a very bright smile on his face. And he said, You know, you know where I was? I was up the Hudson, and I visited the gravesite of Teilhard de Chardin. And Teilhard de Chardin was the philosopher that, that believed in a new atmosphere, that life was evolving towards a human form, that this was God's great plan. And I understand that this is probably the, the deep anchor that is underneath uh, the dinosauroid, and I just think that, I think it's an interesting idea, but very wrong. Yeah. Totally well, it reminds yeah. me of the rebuttal would be uh, Charlton Heston in the Planet of the Apes. There's got to be something better out there. But then uh, things didn't work out too well for him, did it? <laughs> 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 well, I want to thank both of you. It was a terrific show. Uh, I'll link to both of your, your websites. So thank you for a very lively and engaging discussion. Thank you very much. Very well. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. See you.